Hi, I'm Maggie. Um, I'm 33, and I live in Puyallup, Washington, and I really enjoy the work that I do. I actually answer 911 calls for the county that I live in, and um, get to, on a daily basis, um, talk to people when they're really having probably not the best day of their life. So it's important to me to, to be able to help people. I was diagnosed with cancer and I was originally told uh, stage two breast cancer on January 22nd of 2014. And it was a shock like none other. I know what the risk factors are for breast cancer. I was 32 years old at the time, which is young. Um, I was single, had no children. Um, I'm Caucasian. Uh, there are higher statistics for women of color getting breast cancer. I don't have any family history and I'm very healthy and careful with what I eat. About the only risk factor I had was being female. I went into my doctor and said, okay, well, you know, what's treatment going to look like? We talked about treatment options and she said, you know, before we can begin treatment, we have one more step to do. We need to do a PET scan. So I went in for my PET scan and um, I knew right away that, that there was something wrong, um, just in the demeanor of the person that was doing the scan. She said, I'm really sorry to tell you that um, your cancer is actually stage four. It's not stage two. It's invasive ductal carcinoma, and it has already spread to your bones and your liver. You have three tumors in your liver and six places on your bones that have metastasized. My oncologist did say, it's very odd to see someone your age, um, 32 years old, with this type of cancer, you don't see it in women um, your age that don't have children. It's present in women that have been through menopause, women that are receiving hormone treatments, women that are um, that have had more than three or more pregnancies, um, and sometimes women that had their first pregnancy at a really young age. So already she was seeing that it was strange that I was there. We talked a little bit about my medical history and she had asked, you know, had I ever been on hormones or been on the pill or that sort of thing? And I said, well, yeah. And I told her about my history of egg donation. And I remember seeing the look on her face and I said, did, did this cause my cancer? Did being a donor cause my, me to get cancer? And she said, I'm a firm believer that a positive attitude is going to do just as much for you as the medication that I'm going to give you. But she didn't answer my question. Later on, she went so far as to say, um, yes, we do have information that shows that exposure to these things um, can result in certain types of cancer or can at least increase your chances of certain types of cancer. So I asked her point blank, is this something that you know because of the type of doctor that you are or is this something that all doctors know? And she said, this information is available to any doctor that wants to find it. And for me, that was crushing to hear because for me, that was the first confirmation that this person that I thought cared about me probably was just using me. I very much feel that there's a certain, you know, hindsight is 2020 um, feeling to my experience. And I look at who I was when I was donating and how I thought my life would turn out, how I thought it might look, the things that I thought that I wanted, and um, that I didn't really consider, I, I was living in the moment, I didn't really consider that much um, how things could turn out. And when I reached out and, and sent you that email and you know saw that article and, and contacted you, 
I still just didn't want to believe that other people shared this story with me. I wanted to think that I was the exception. When I was in college, I was teaching swimming lessons as a part-time job, and I had these two boys in my class that were just fantastic. I got to know their parents very well, and she told me after swim lessons one day, you know, my boys, they're, they're adopted. My husband and I have gone through lots of fertility treatments, and we, we never could get pregnant. They really spent a lot of time talking to me about how they made their family. And um, it was just fascinating to me that there are people that desperately want to have kids and, and for some reason they can't get there on their own. She talked to me a little bit about egg donation and the clinic that they had gone through. And she said, you know, they're always looking for really intelligent women um, with, a, with a good background that would be interested in, in helping other people. And at the time I was... 19 or 20 and I just thought wow that's a way that I could help people and I'm not using my eggs and I didn't know anything about the process so I went in to talk to somebody about it and and that's how I first got started. When I went to uh, the clinic that my um, friend had uh, gone through I remember sitting down with her and she said look, this is a really long and involved process and um, we are going to compensate you. You're going to be paid for this. We call it donation, but we pay you for this because of what you are going to go through in the donation process. We started off right away with a packet that was probably 20 or 30 pages and it was all about my um, my life. You know, what was my medical history? Because people want that are choosing an egg donor want to make sure that there's not going to be health issues that coincide with anything that they might have. For me at that time, you know, we're talking about going out multiple generations. So this was something that I had to talk to my family about because I needed to know, well, is there anything in my family history medically that I don't know about that I need to know about? So I knew at that time in my life that I did not have any genetic link to any type of cancer. When I was going through the process of um, finding out if I would be a good donor, if I was somebody that they would choose, the, the process of that was very much presented to me. Um, and again, I donated with two different doctors, and it was the same at each one. So the process of going through that was very much, oh, well, we get a lot of donors, and it would be very special if you were chosen you kind of develop this train of thought where you you really want to be chosen. It would be something special to be one of the chosen ones that, that could help people. And you do have to sign um, a disclosure agreement that, that you're aware of what the risks are. And the disclosures that I signed or the notification of risks, um, they were one page. And the only mention of any type of cancer was a, a two-sentence um, kind of short paragraph in, in the middle of the page that said, um, in the 1970s, it was thought that um, exposure to these type of hormones for a lengthy period of time could cause uh, ovarian cancer, and that has since been proven false. When you see the word cancer, you know, it really makes you stop and say, I'm going to read that again. I don't want to put myself in a situation where I could potentially be harming myself or my ability to have children later on. And that was something that really stood out to me. I signed that document 10 times. I know word for word what it says. And if I didn't, I still have copies of it. And I felt that because this was a doctor and this form was presented to me by a doctor, written by a doctor, that I could trust what was on that form. Um, I was actually chosen within a couple of weeks of having submitted my information. I was very much made to feel, oh, you've been chosen. This is so exciting. We can't wait for, for you to, you know, for this family to, to have this opportunity. And we wish you could, we could introduce you. It's, it would just be such an amazing connection for you. 
So I went in and I got a little crash course in what I was going to be doing as far as the, the medications. And they do uh, an ultrasound, measure your eggs, and um, how quickly they were growing so that they could time the um, retrieval when, when they remove the eggs. And um, they have to time that with the recipient and the drugs that they're on. When you get to the point where your eggs are large enough to be retrieved, then you get a, an HCG injection, and that's a trigger shot. It triggers your, your body to be ready for the retrieval. You go in, they um, knock you out, and they uh, go in with a needle and extract your eggs, and then they go to the, to the recipient. When I woke up after my first retrieval, the nurse came in and she said, I can't wait to use you again. You lit up like the Christmas tree in Times Square at Christmas. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, I've never gotten so many eggs from a donor before. And I remember thinking, oh, well, that's kind of cool. That's really good for the recipient because now they don't have to go through this painful process again of, you know, they, that those are their eggs now so they can they can choose to freeze them and use them again and they don't have to go through this whole process. I was not informed at that time that the recipient can actually turn around and sell those eggs. It, it was a relatively minimal amount actually that I was compensated, um, $1,600, and that went to books and fees for classes for a semester. Um, but they called me up again and said, oh, your file's still in the system and a, another family has chosen you again. This is just really exciting because it worked so well last time. I definitely was not forced. I didn't feel like I was coerced, but I do think that um, I, I was a little naive and it didn't occur to me that I could say no, because in my mind, I would have been saying, no, I don't want to help people anymore. So after I donated um, the, for the second time with this uh, doctor, I um, was approaching the time in my academic career where I needed to have a culminating project. So I chose to do my project on infertility and um, the process that an egg donor might, the role that they might play in that process. So um, I had contacted my doctor that I had donated through and they said, well, you know, we're actually not using local donors any longer. We're going through a company in Idaho, but we're referring all of our donors to this other doctor up in Bellevue. So um, I remember contacting them and saying, this is what I'm studying in school. I, I'm looking to maybe speak to donors. And, and that's when I kind of found out, well, the majority of donors are anonymous. And um, they said, well, we can't you know, give you any information on any of our donors, but um, you know, you could always go online and try and create a survey and that sort of thing and hope that you get people. So I had to change the scope of my project and I was continuing to talk with the people at this um, clinic. They said, oh, well, um, we heard that you had a, a really good experience and you were a great donor. Um, w would you consider doing it again? And I, I really felt like um, that time it was more I was being approached by them. It was kind of couched to me in that, um, you know, oh, we've talked with this other doctor and we know you already have this experience and we're looking for great donors and we heard that you were just a really wonderful donor and so we'd like to add you to our to our team, you know, and to our donor family. And it's, uh, it's funny, the language, looking back now, the language that I remember them using. When I um, signed up to be a donor with this um, new clinic, they um, did get my medical records from the other clinic so they could see um, how I responded to um, the shots and, and the hormones and such. I was told it would be somewhere between what I was paid before, which was the 1600 and 2000 And I remember thinking, oh, that's interesting. It must be because this is a more affluent area um, than where I was previously, and that's how they could afford to pay more. There was a nurse that worked with the doctor that I had known for years at that point. I remember her saying that she was trying to leave the clinic because she was concerned about some of the things that were going on there. And she said, you know, you really should 
be asking for more um, for what you're going through and how many times he's used you and everything that he's gotten from you. You should be demanding more money. He has it to give to you. And uh, I was very uncomfortable with that. I was uncomfortable with her saying that to me. I was uncomfortable with this idea that, um, that I could say what I wanted, like I could demand an amount of money or I could say, I want to be compensated with this much money. To me, that felt like less of a donor relationship and more of a, you know, sales relationship. When I signed up with this clinic, um, over a period of about 10 years, I donated eight times. Almost every time that I donated, it was um, a very similar experience. There were two instances where things went differently. The first time um, that happened, I think it was maybe my second or third time donating, I had an abnormal pap smear come back and I'd never had one that was abnormal before. He said, well, I, um, I'll do a LEAP procedure for you, which is where they go in and they burn off the cells um, that are showing to be precancerous. The LEAP procedure was, um, I was told it was actually fairly routine. And at the time, um, yeah, I was just so thankful that, you know, cancer, oh, that's such a scary word. And pre-cancer, oh, I didn't know you could catch cancer before it was cancer. I had donated in August of 2013 and you're required to do a physical exam before every donation and when they were doing my breast exam they felt a lump and they sent me for a mammogram but they sent me to a person right down the street from their office that works with them that does mammograms for them. I'm not accusing anybody of willingly looking past something but um, there was an obvious lump in my breast in August. I, I knew it was there, I could feel it. They did a mammogram and an ultrasound of the breast and um, told the doctor that there was nothing there. Yes, there was like a palpable lump that you could feel, but in all likelihood it was a cyst because of my age and um, just I don't have the risk factors. I mean, it was scary to go in for a mammogram at 32, but I thought, okay, well, they know what they're doing. You know, mammograms are, they're designed to, to catch that sort of thing. Then I went through the process of donating, donated in August of 2013. And then um, throughout September and October, I um, would watch that lump grow and, uh, just kept convincing myself that it was a figment of my imagination and that that's not something that can actually happen and that I'd already been told that this is nothing to worry about. By the time November came around, I went to my um, PCP and I said, I I'm nervous about this and I, I don't know what to do. I feel like it's getting bigger. And she said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna send you for a a mammogram. And I said, okay, well, I just had one done in August. She said, no, well, we'll send you to Carol Milgard Breast Center in Tacoma and they'll do a mammogram. So I went and they did a mammogram and an ultrasound and came back um, that a, a biopsy needed to be done um, to just further determine exactly what we were dealing with. I actually had that done in January. Um, between having the ultrasound and mammogram and then scheduling the biopsy, um, I had four appointments scheduled and canceled by a doctor who just couldn't seem to get their calendar straight. So that's when I ended up in January in this new doctor's office and I had my biopsy done and then she called me the next day and said that it was cancer. Years later I look at it very differently because I think okay, if you and I both know now that the drugs that I was given as a donor, um, there, there is a connection to women that develop certain types of cancer and hormone-related injections or drugs that, or pills that you take. If you knew that and you didn't inform me 
And you also knew that at some point, because you treated me for it, that I had pre-cancer. What were you thinking that it was appropriate to continue to give me hormones and take that risk without ever notifying me that it was a risk? Well, you know, it is, it is a painful and private story and there is some shame that comes along with it in admitting that I willingly chose to do something that I thought I was informed about, but I will always wonder, is there more that I could have done? Is there more that I should have done to truly understand what I was getting myself into? We got involved with Relay, and I was actually still, I got in chemo the day before Relay, so I couldn't be in the sunlight. And that night, um, walking the track, walking the laps, uh, my dad and I walked in the dark, and it was the first time that my dad and I talked about me being an egg donor and what um, he thought might have happened. And my dad said, you and I both know that had you not been getting hormone injections, there's no reason that, yeah, sure, maybe you would have gotten a hormone-related, an estrogen-positive cancer in your 40s or your 50s. But there's no reason it would have shown up at 32. It, there's no reason it would have spread throughout your body the way that it did if all it was exposed to was your natural estrogen, your natural hormones. <laughs> 